All right, welcome everybody to meet the sponsors. Today we have a really special guest. I think I first met Tony Yorkman in 2006 or 2007, back when I was at Core. What is that, 15 years, Tony? How long have you been with KN? Uh, coming up on 19 years now. 19, 19 years. years this year. Right on. And how many of those years have you been issuing sponsorships? Uh, well, let's see. I, I started at KN 2002. I came in to, under sales support, but um, after about a year, uh, I started falling in love with the marketing side. I was helping out with a lot of projects, and I moved over there immediately and started. Uh, uh, started immediately working on product sponsorships and uh, run our truck and trailer program. So almost the whole time. So I guess 17, yeah. 17 years at least. As I think for as long as I've known you, you've been issuing sponsorships. You've been head of sports marketing. You've had many people below you that have activated the sponsorships, but you and I have always kept in touch and we've always dealt with each other when it comes to sponsorships, both at the series level and at some uh, racer levels. At, I, out of curiosity, how many series or racers do you sponsor today if do you know the number yeah uh, i know a roundabout you know so at, and i'd say in our height when we had a full team you know and everything was moving and we were at 300 plus relationships right and and that's going from you know a lawnmower racer up to our multi-level nascar partnership um, um which uh started a number of years ago uh but currently you know, everything's evolving, changing a little bit, our COVID situation. Uh, we're down to roughly about 45 to uh, probably about closer to 50 at this point. Okay. Then we have a constant communication and a constant piece going on. Uh, not that we wouldn't probably even be doing more, but some of the people that we worked with for a number of years have taken the last year off or um, kind of moving and, and they're just getting back around to it. So right on, right on. And then uh, this is a question I ask all the guests that come on the show. Uh, how many decks or proposals do you see on an annual basis? And I'm asking that because everybody's on this webinar to figure out what's going to set their deck or proposal apart. How many, how many sponsorship requests do you say you get a year? I probably get more proposals than I get decks, which it should be the other way around, right? But um, <laughs> I would say, I don't know, we can do the math, but I would say there's probably a good five to 10 per week um, in some form that come through. Uh, you know, proposals, I kind of sit to the side and, and maybe, you know, do a little bit of work around and, and see if I can follow and engage with them a little bit. But, you know, the decks, I, I take a little bit more time to evaluate and I start to um, say pursue, but I would say, yeah, I mean, you're, you're talking 52 weeks in the year, right? So yeah, that's a lot. 500 plus. So you just said something really interesting. You said, you probably should get a deck instead of a proposal first time out from some racers. So I say this all the time. You have not been on one of my webinars. You haven't heard it yet, but I say all the time, don't send a proposal to a company that you don't know yet. Um, get to know them first. You don't want to propose somebody until, you know, there's a relationship and the deck starts that relationship. What do you look for in a deck and what kind of a deck would set itself apart so that it would actually attract your attention? You might open it and call the racer back and say, you know what, let's, let's, uh, let's talk about your program. I want to learn more. Yeah. I mean, that's great. That's actually a perfect question. And, and I learned something when I started doing this for k and you know, uh, before I actually had ownership of our sports marketing group, uh, roughly about 15 years ago. And I had a boss here, um, that he had a great saying, um, that I kind of adapted and held on to, which was, you know, never, never build a plan around your opportunities, always find the opportunities to fit your plan. So what I, I look like for that. in those decks are really somebody that understands that our plan is right. And, and then shows me how their opportunity fits that plan because without it, it's, I have no interest, right? It, it has to fit my agenda. And if they can figure out what my agenda is, which is tough. It's really tough to know what that is, but even if they can open that door a little bit, you know, ultimately everybody should know my plan is to sell filters, <laughs> yes. right? So if they figure out a way to tell me how they're going to sell filters, well, that opens the door to say that they're interested in my plan and they're looking for ways to do it. And then as that progresses, we'll find more opportunities to, uh, within their program that fits our plan. So nice. it's, it's really more about if they understand what our plan is, um, and again, there, there's multiple levels to that, but just find one. So it sounds like 
you know, sending sending you a proposal without knowing what your plan is 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 it's almost uh, not going to get them a very high consideration when it comes to your evaluating them. But a deck now will open that door where they can start a conversation and learn what your plan is. It, are you willing to discuss your sure. plan to people who you know and meet and, and get to know what the race is or even meet maybe virtually, oh. you know, by email? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it, because, again, it's tough to know what, what our plan is uh, without actually having those conversations. And that's why I prefer a deck. You know, we, we run through get, when I do get a deck. Um, or even if I'm, if something that's proposed, I'm constantly looking at what's going on in the scene. And if there's somebody that I see out there that I think that they may have something that fits our plan, I immediately start evaluating them for the following year. I mean, I, I start mm -hmm. right now, every, every day, uh, as I go through and I cruise social and I, I look through those kind of things, uh, I look for people that I'm going to pay attention through the end of this year and see how they perform and see how their program really fits our plan. And then when we start getting closer, that's when I open that door. You know, obviously I'm only one person and there's a lot of people out there. We just talked about 500 of these different people that have actually made the attempt to come and, and do something in some way. So it's not very easy to react to all of those. But um, if there's something I see that I like, then I'll definitely jump and I'll open and, you know, the conversation and, and a lot of those things. Not that anybody should wait for those doors to open for them, right? Start knocking on those doors. But make sure that you have something to say when you when somebody does answer. You kind of have to know what the business objective is before you propose to be part of their marketing, right? And it's, you know, how, how can right. you be a marketing brand ambassador, an extension of the marketing arm, if you don't know what their marketing objectives are? So, so how often does your plan change? And out of curiosity, what is the current plan? What are you currently doing with uh, teams, series, properties that, that represent KNN? I would say there's always an underlying plan um, that's just consistent, never really changes. And, and, and it is about, you know, selling filters and how we can sell more filters but, and how we can always prove our, say, product validity within the space of motorsports. Mm -hmm. um, th th that plan never really changes. Uh, I would say there's adjacent plans, um, new product launches, things like that. And, and it depends on right. what we have going on for that year, it depends on what our plan would be. Um, so this year alone, we've got three different new products that we're looking to launch um, that are outside of our normal air filter and oil filter or intake properties. But if it's something that fits those, that's where we start to explore what you know additional plans are. Um, currently, again, product launches um, and then maintaining some of the core. Uh, I think that you know a big part of where we got almost sidelined is because of COVID and we've all had to adjust. We've all had to make adjustments. And I know everybody hates the COVID word because it's used for everything nowadays, <laughs> yeah. but really that's had to adjust our business. We've had to adjust our agendas and adjust our plans to fit. And our plan has always been product validity through motorsports. Um, and, and with motorsports thinning out and we're now getting back to those things and we're now being really getting more uh, fluent in motorsports. But in the meantime, we found the digital side what part of those mm. that can actually support. So we want somebody that can perform on the track, but also off the track. Uh, we're, we're, we're fortunate enough to have a product that works in, in both cases. That's interesting. So on and off the track, um, when you say off the track, do you mean just in between races, they're doing good on social media, or do you mean perhaps they're also now engaged in sim racing and iRacing and racing digitally? I, I don't think digital is, is much of a uh, interest to us. Um, it's a great addition, right? But I think it goes back to what you mentioned. It is more stuff that is done in between the racing. It doesn't necessarily have to be a social media aspect of it. Um, it could be supporting the brands in a number of ways through media. It could be on site at different their local events. You know, look, there's certain states that are back up in full swing and, and they're they're back going. And you know, if somebody's out there has a different partner that they're supporting and at a Pet Boys Grand Opening for a retailer of ours. Well, hey, I want to see those kind of actions happen, and I want to see how they're exploiting all of their partners. Yeah, right. What's a good example? Give me a good example of a good brand ambassador, someone who represented the brand in a way that met the plan, and you love what they were doing, and you're probably going to renew because this, you know, fits in the plan. You got racers on here who want to also do the same. They would like a sponsorship from K and N. Mm -hmm. Give us an example of what who they should copy, and you know what worked. Sure. I mean, like, well, obviously there's big names, right? And we have quite bon a few big names. We're yeah. connected to some of the bigger series. Vaughn Gittin, somebody, 
And yeah, of course he, he kicks ass at what he does, but he, he's getting paid for that, you know, handsomely. He's, he's figured that piece out. But someone that's a little bit more relatable to what we talk about today and what other people probably are on the same line is somebody like Martino Motorsports. There's, there's Ryan and Tom Martino. Okay. And uh, they're NHRA drag racers. They race on the sportsman level. Um, and they really flourished during the pandemic. You know, these guys did really great on the track. They're great ambassadors. Um, and, and when the pandemic hit, he really embraced some of the newer platforms like TikTok and went on there and okay. started working on and doing different pieces like maintenance and service. And he jumped ahead and he, he actually took the time, not just with K&N, he's partnered with a number of people, but went back and learned a lot about his, his uh, brand, the brands he's connected to and their products and how he could use them, right? Nice. How can he exploit them through some of those different media uh, outlets? And, um, and again, you know, being creative and going out there and saying he's doing a little bit more, it's not somebody that has a marketing degree and maybe he does i don't know maybe i should ask brian he may, he may do because he's <laughs> yeah. done really well but i i doubt he does i think it's more about the fact that you know he found himself a little bit more time like the rest of us and he found a really good reaction and now you know say he's a on the micro influencer level he's got less than ten thousand views but what was really a big value to us from what he did was he creates consistent content content that actually includes our product and our brands and how he uses it down to like doing oil changes on his golf cart. Oh, wow. Right. And wow. he uses our filter and he shows him doing those things and he puts it on there. What makes it valuable to not only K and N, but also to Martino Motorsports is that, you know, he puts it out there and you're going, okay, his followers are 10,000 and you can count your CPMs and you can decide what that's really worth. But it becomes much more for us when we get to turn around and use that content and push it through our channels. And now we're talking about we've got two million people that we're reaching with with that content and showing, and we get eyeballs on on that K and N logo. But more importantly, the K and N product that's being used in an everyday situation. He's uh, changing a filter on on his wife's Camry, just a cabin filter. Well, that's a big deal to us to be able to show that somebody like him is entrusted in our product. Now it helps K and N because we've got consistent pr- content that is sh- exploiting our product by an end user. But also, it helps Martino. It helps then gain that kind of uh, notoriety and, and that part where people say, hey, look at what these guys are doing. And he can turn around to his other sponsors and go, look at, I've got a partner like K&N that's coming out here and putting uh, Salt Life is one of his sponsors, putting Salt Life um, in, in, in normal non-endemic brand in a normal situation within our industry. So, you know, it, it's a value on both sides for us. So it sounds like he's a average team that uh, is very similar to probably a lot of the attendees on this webinar right now. How did you find him or how did he approach you? What was his trick to getting you to sponsor him? That's a good question. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> you know, he was one that I inherited as we've done a little okay. shuffling with responsibilities here at k and He's one that I came across and, and Got it. we've been partnered for a few years and, you know, Shame on us because I've never really seen what he's had to offer. I've never really seen a lot of those things. Our communication internally wasn't that great. And all of a sudden I come across and he reaches out to me and said, hey, I heard you're my new contact. Right on. Okay. Uh, so yeah, for the interim time it is, and we're going to get somebody for you. And next, you know, I, I start reviewing some of this stuff and I'm going, this is amazing. <laughs> you know, he's doing a great job. And, you know, it turns out there's a handful of guys that are like that, that I've been able to spend some time with. Um, I will say that a majority of the guys that we have actually connected with and gals and any of our partners. I would say on the grassroots level, um, again, people that are more relatable in this way have come from different, um, you know, proposals that we've had through interactions. Um, but I'd say there's also a good portion that have come through different connections and a lot of the B2B partnerships mm-hmm. that have gone, right? I've looked at and seen and said, okay, hey, this is somebody that Lucas Oil is talking about consistently and, and they have some some good things going on. and. You know, we, we've ridden the coattails, to, so to say, on a, on a lot right. of people, whether it be Lucas or Optima or, you know, one of our uh, many partners that we work on the B2B side. So have you ever sponsored someone you've never met? Have you ever sponsored a, a racer just through the deck or just through uh, correspondence without actually meeting them in person? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I honestly, I think that majority of them are nowadays, um, you know, as as everything's evolved and. Okay. And it's all about efficiency today, right? I mean, look, everything's a everything's an email and everything's a, a a web call or something along those lines. But yeah, I mean, I do that quite often. And 
you know, if somebody's really doing their job right and they're sending me over a deck and, and getting my attention, I, I already feel like I know them before I sponsor them, right? Because I'm following their day in, day out routines, whether it be the things that are on the track or whether it be um, through different media outlets or, or those things. But the, the relationship uh, hasn't started, but the acknowledgement is already there. Right. And, and until I get to kind of know you on that level, look, I mean, there's a lot of people that we meet through this business. We become friends. We really appreciate Alex. You and I have a relationship through those things. You know, that was something that started through the core relationship. And that was just based off of a discussion because quite honestly, you, you had a customer list to take care of and look at what happened. You know, there's a lot of those, but those opportunities don't come until we have something that we really need to accomplish together. And, um, it's hard for me to even get the time or, or, or to set that time aside when again, 500 DEX proposals come through for a year. So it, it really comes down to uh, opening that door so that I can at least acknowledge and see who you are and then work on those things. That meeting comes later when we're ready to, to, to come across. But I, again, I would say probably at least 75% of the time will come from um, you know, uh, email communication, um, evaluation through social or any of those kind of things, or again, B2B before right. we even meet in person. Now, now you, I know you sponsor a lot of different series and a lot of racers in different series. And even if there's no races, like during COVID, there's still things that people can do uh, digitally and online to represent the brand. Sure. Um, is the series even that important anymore? Or is just the racers proactivity and how they market themselves important? It, for example, maybe 90% of your sponsorships are in NHRA. Maybe you have so many you don't need anymore, but someone comes through and does really good at promoting themselves. Would you add more? Or are there any series that you just really don't need any more representation because you've got it covered? Where are the opportunities for someone who wants to be sponsored by k &N? Sure. I, I think that I think the series are still important. I think that racing um, on some type of level is still important. Uh, there's a connection piece there. Uh, it gives it gives that person, and again, not to keep using the word validity, but it gives them a validity to the sport, right? Which makes that all their other actions that much more valuable. Um, you know, Alex, you know very well, I'm not a competitive person and I'm not really into racing. I have a Bond. I mean, great appreciation for what everybody does. I love automotive and I love everything, but the racing just not me. I've never really had an interest in doing that kind of piece. But there's no way that I'm going to get out there and be able to suffice a company like K&N and their needs by just saying, hey, I run this filter in my car. Right. Right. It's something I have to have some kind of credibility. And that does come from the track and that comes from racing and that becomes from um, the competition side through these race series. Now, is the real value from there? That's questionable. It's evolving into something different, in my opinion. And I think that it, it's, the, the value is shifting in those ways. It used to be more about you know, being on the track and being in competition. And just a small part was what was the outside activities. You know, back to what we call the NASCAR days, right? You know, yeah, went on yeah. Sunday, buy on Monday process. Bob Taska said that. That's not there anymore. Yeah, that, that's not there anymore for really. I mean, you can look at look at some of the people that do just mediocre in their racing, not, not for any fault, not that they don't have talent or maybe whatever the case may be, but they are really great at catching the, the consumer's attention. And they're really great at pushing brands and catching those products. Uh, again, it's because of really keeping that fan base and that consumer base with their attention on them. And it, it doesn't always take you know, every bit of that minute on the track, but it still has to be there a little bit to give them validity on that space. Right. Now, I, I can't see the screen, but Tammy's motioning to me. I have a feeling that some some uh, questions are coming through on the chat room. I'm going to ask you something real quick, Tony, and then I'll, uh, Tammy can let me know if there's a question that we need to answer as well. <laughs> um, or what do you think, babe? Is there? Yeah, if you want or if you have yeah let's do it. Well, go ahead. Go ahead. Do that first. Because uh, I, I think I just figured out why my remote's not working. And so I'm going to go all excited. I'm going to go fix it while she's asking the question. social media reports from drivers that show impressions and engagement? That's great. And I think that that's a great question. I, I think it really depends on who the company is and who they report up to, to quite honest. Uh, look, K&N was purchased by a company called Goldman Sachs. I'm sure some of you've heard of them. <laughs> 
uh, metrics are huge. Everything I've got to give to them metrics. And they're really what it comes from is because uh, their acknowledgement and understanding of what our industry is and what our community and our culture is, is not the greatest. Um, so giving them metrics get, gets us a better selling power. I would say that it, it in most cases, going to be different. Historically, at can and those metrics really weren't a big deal, um, but today they are. So if you have access to those things, uh, which is as simple as joining some of these programs like a Hook It or somebody like that, that can actually give you those kind of valuations where they do it for you, it, it, it's worth investing. But I, I again, everybody's going to be different. For KN, currently, that is that is a one of those major pieces that are needed. Right. I think now, I fixed. I'm sorry. My... Not to... I think I fixed my remote. I'm not sure. We'll see here in a second. But uh, do you only sponsor and racers? Scott's one, it looks like you fixed your hair too. <laughs> well, I took all yours and I gave, put it on me. He took it from you and gave it to me, but he did. <laughs> <laughs> so, so do you only sponsor racers or do you sponsor non-racing personalities? No, that's another great one because and historically, no, no, we've never raced to sponsor anybody but racers. It was really performance driven. And now we've kind of evolved outside of that, you know, um, because there is a whole nother culture out there that are not racers that are just car enthusiasts, automotive enthusiasts. And there is a, an extreme crossover. Um, but we've started expanding out into those ways and working on builds because it is more relatable um, to the average consumer. They aspire on the racing side for sure. And so we still need those hero figures, but we also need that day-to-day -day guy. I think for k and it's always going to be about performance. We're a performance company, performance yeah. products. Um, you know, it's, it's an air filter. I mean, <laughs> I, I'm not misguided in the way of thinking that it's something major, but it is a performance-driven product. That is, that is the, the sentiment behind our product. It always has been, and I don't think it'll ever change. Uh, but we also understand that there, there's the other side, um, which are like the people like me. People like you, Alex, that maybe don't have an object, you know, don't really have a desire to get in that seat and, and race around uh, a, a track um, because they don't have that fuel in that way. But we love doing what we do outside of that and an automotive enthusiasts, you know, in that way. Uh, I have project cars, I've got multiple vehicles, I've got a lot of, I got my own right. craziness behind it, you know, and uh, my own sickness, but it, it's not in the <laughs> motorsport side. But again, the, the enthusiasts, part of it is something that's a is a general grab for for Canaan. I actually got back from the desert last night at 1 a.m. So and I was riding riding in the yeah. razor that you gave me the cold air intake system for. So that's you know yeah, what? There you go. Not not just a fan but a customer. Tammy so there's a longer one. Can you guys can you hear Tammy when she's reading the question or you, you can probably see the questions on your screen Scott too. Okay. Scott gave me a thumbs up. All right. Okay. Um, it says, I operate a drag racing series that will be televised for our 2022 Just lost the light. And have been starting to provide decks for multi-year sponsorships. How do you look at those types of longer-term opportunities? Oh, yeah. You know, longer-term is really difficult. You know, for K&N, we like to have that flexibility. It's It's... It's a, it's, a, it's a little bit of a double edge because we love to have the opportunity to make multi-year plans and work in those ways. But we also love to have a little bit of the flexibility. So if our plans do change year to year that we can adjust. Um, I would say that uh, that is our statement, but I don't think we follow it too much. It, it, you can, can, can attest that just about every one of our partnerships um, have been um, multi-years um just every year of their their consecutive but they've just been multi-year programs there's there's very rarely do we have a partner for a single year they, they go on um i think it really depends on the dollar commitment for knn if it's a low enough dollar amount uh, and i know that's all relative when you say lower enough but if it's lower enough based off of our budget or our plans coming up um i think it's it's a doable piece if it's a larger dollar commitment we're going to shy away from the multi-years because we want to be able to have those flexibilities. We never know what's going to happen, right? We don't know how things are going to, to work out. Uh, the bigger complication I think it comes with doing a multi-year deal is because we do have an ever-shifting plan. Um, and it still goes back to what I said earlier. Your opportunity has to fit our plan. Uh, we, can, we can base the plan off of the core, the core objectives, 
Uh, but we're always looking for that something that has that added value to that plan. Um, it's got to be on the going beyond just the selling the filters, right? And feeding the other parts of the company, which in turn sell filters, but we want you to sell filters. We want to help us uh, sell our filters. So it's really hard to, to make a commitment to something in a multi-year deal when we just don't know where it's at. So I appreciate you covering for me while I'm struggling to get this light issue fixed. Tammy's now fixing it here, but <laughs> hey, I have a proposal and I want to send it to you because I got a really cool race program and I want to offer you exposure on my helmet on my race suit, on my car, on my hauler, on the awnings, on all my posters, you're gonna get exposure everywhere I go, the Canon filter is gonna be. Canon filters uh, logo will be. What do you think about that? Do you think you'll sponsor me? I think it doesn't fit my plan. Hmm. It's not about logos, It's not huh? an opportunity that fits my plan. No, it's not about logos. You know, the, the, the logos do help, but he, here's another big thing too. I've always had this, uh, this, this feeling, I've always had this feeling that I wanted to be part, a part of a program where it looks like they wanted me to be there and not that I paid to be there. Yeah. Yeah. So I, exactly. I want to be a part of somebody that actually runs our product and they actually exactly. care about it. Right? And they feel like they need us to be there. Um, you know, I, I've never wanted to be the company that was plastered from head to toe K and N. And then because that does look like a pay, paid advertisement, that's what it is. And, um, Although it does help us with, say, branding internally, we're doing cataloging our customers and things like that. But everything we do is is really about the the again the product, not so much the the logo. So we want people to see what products. We want the story to be the product and not the logo. I mean, we've got a great story as a company. Um, it's a heritage brand. You know, it's it's something that's been around for fifty plus years now, and and. Um, you know, K and N has been the the Kleenex of performance air filters for a number of years, and it's it's great to be able to say that it's made my job easy the last twenty years. Everybody thinks that I uh, <laughs> yeah. that that you know K and N's it, they just cut their niche out. It's been a lot about timing and and, and so on, but it's uh, the signage is not like a big deal to us. It's it's really about inclusion, support, um, and that product validity goes back to so. Great, you can offer signage, but that should be icing on the cake. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And you and I have talked about that many times. If you can open up distribution channels for them, if you can help them um, increase their brand equity by giving them prestige and first-class value, if you can introduce them to relationships, like Tony was just saying, you know, the with other brands like Lucas Oil or Optima Battery, or perhaps there's other relationships that you have with uh, retailers that you can get k &N into a, a new four by four shop and maybe they, that shop doesn't sell any products yet. That's what has value. And that's what I'm presuming Tony means as part of the plan to sell more filters. More so than just logo. Yeah, that's absolutely true. But, no, absolutely true. It's, it's again, it doesn't have to be any specific area where we sell filters, but you know, we want you to sell more filters, whether it's driving website traffic, whether it's doing something in those ways. So it is an ambassadorship. It's an endorsement. It's all of those things. Um, but again, not in the way of uh, logo ambassadorship. We really want product validity. And again, we want people to believe that, that and know that, that you're supporting this product because you believe in it. And it's something that helps you and it'll help them. Right. We're going to see if there's another question here. I, I can see the screen is moving. Tammy, what you got? Yeah. Do you look at smaller driver programs, ones that run completely out of pocket? small media outlets? If so, what could a smaller program offer k &N that they don't really have? Well, actually we do. I would say a majority of our programs are smaller programs. And like I'm telling you, we've got 45 plus here this year. And I would say that uh, most of the people on here wouldn't recognize half of them, right? Because they are not, we, we, I, I sponsor a lawnmower racer. I've been sponsoring him for like 12 years. He races lawnmowers. You know what he does though? He, he does a great job. He creates his content. It's a little bit more unique. Um, he uses our product um, and, and he ends up in those places that really uh, help fill in those niches. And um, when, when it comes to the, the content fill and um, his reach is not great, say, but the events he goes to and the things that he does, those are great. He, he gets, a, you know, they, they, the US LMRA, if anybody's ever heard of that, United States Lawnmower Racing Association. <laughs> They've been around forever. 
Um, they do a great job. They're a very family wholesome thing. They don't have a media package. They don't do any of the things, but they do a lot of events that are at, um, they tour over and they do 60 plus events per year racing 60. Wow. Okay. From a lawnmower racing and they do like county fairs. So those are big pieces and they offer us something that's more of a crossover again, to the point where we talk about the enthusiast, right? So their exposure is different than the signage it's different whatever what they're doing is they're bringing they're bringing our brands out to a consumer but it's again through that influence it's not necessarily going hey i've got this big sign right come look at this big k and n logo on the side of it because you know what half those people don't even know what that k and n stands for they don't know what well most people don't know what k and n stands for right but they don't know what it actually is they don't know what the product is connected to it I mean, it could be a whistle that we're selling versus an air filter. They wouldn't know the difference. So when they go out to those events and they're talking to those consumers and the consumers see those pieces and they see those products, that's what makes that partnership impactful. And, and so I would say that a majority of the farms that we work with are on the smaller end. Um, we have a lot of product-based sponsorships and a lot of those, I would say that we don't have one product sponsorship, or I'm sorry, one monetary sponsorship that did not start in a product format of some way. Not that it wouldn't, but currently where we have, even somebody like we referred to earlier, Von Gittin Jr. We were his very first sponsor on his car back before he drove Ford. And I won't say that because I don't want to get him in trouble, but he, he worked in IT and he just did this personal agenda and, and he had a little bit more charisma. And it was one of those pieces that I thought, hey, this guy can really do something with what he's got going on. And he filled an area that we were just starting to explore was drifting. And right. you're talking, this is 17, 17 years ago, right? 17 years ago, who thought with drifting would even be a thing and who would think it would still be going today? But he found that. And so we took a chance, worked with him. But now, again, he's one of our biggest partners. But again, it's not because of the sport, not because of what he worked in. When he started back then, it was a program that nobody really knew what it was about. It's an entertainment version of motorsports, right? It's a judge competition not a time competition. And, and I saw Vaughn at King of the Hammers. He was not race. He was not drifting. He was racing off-road trucks, rock crawlers. And, you know, I, I know this is probably the question everybody's is curious on the lawnmower racing. Where do you sit and how do you put your foot down without getting your leg chopped off? It's, I don't quite get the lawnmower racing thing, but no, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. So are, hey, are yeah, there- And those things, man, like if anybody's ever followed up with those things and you look, they got some of those lawnmowers that do 90 miles an hour. <laughs> and it's still a lawnmower. <laughs> And, you know, so you only have to pay five grass, bucks to cut your grass, fine. right? It doesn't cost that much because it goes fast. My guy charges me by the <laughs> yeah, hour, you know? The fastest. No. <laughs> <laughs> Classic. All right, we got some more here for you, Tony. Um, let's see. Okay. Got a couple here. How about this one? You mentioned sim racing isn't really a hot button. We host sim racing events that place drivers in real race cars. Is there a value hmm. to brands for the storytelling? Hmm. yeah absolutely and i think that goes back to what i said earlier about the icing on the cake version of it um and i think where the sim racing really comes in and kind of helps us out again that that's where, where some of the evolution is coming into you know not just uh sim but the ev racing and those kind of things again doesn't fit the agenda of product validity right we can tell a story there we can talk about that but it's the icing on the cake so if somebody truly is a, a racer in something and they do the sim racing as an additional piece, then that's great. But then again, that's added value. That's not the core purpose. It's not really kind of the push. But when it comes to putting people into the real car, absolutely. And seeing somebody make a crossover from a sim to an, that's a, it's another great, great opportunity to, to explore. Right. So the, I'm going to back up for a second because I, I didn't get to ask it before this question. But on your, you mentioned that most of the sponsorships, uh, even p- p- potentially Yvonne getting, they start product sponsorships, or at least a lot more guys started a product sponsorship, then it grows and some can grow into dollar sponsorships. And I, I know what you've spent with series and, and Kanan can spend quite handsomely um, on some sponsorships. What, what percentage of your sponsorships currently are product versus dollar? And how many of those that are dollar started with product? Were all of them start with product sponsorship or were there any high dollar sponsorships that, that you started with just because it was the right person filling the right goal or right part of your plan at the time? Uh, there's been a couple throughout the years, but it is more rare. 
Uh, there, there's quite a few people that we've hit right off the bat and said, hey, we start working with them um, on a monetary value. Uh, but, but there's some of that we found out they've been running our product or they've been doing those things for a number of years, whether they were product supported or not, but they were already, you know, product based um, um, supporters, right? Whether we gave them that product or whether they purchased that product or whether they worked in other areas. But I would say a majority of them, uh, but there are, so, there are a few exceptions. I don't think there's been a whole lot that's been, um, let's say, uh, bigger dollars, um, you know, um, where, where somebody's really getting their program funded by K&N. They haven't had a history of a product in small dollars to begin with. What you said was really interesting is a lot of people, I, I, I know their initials, but a lot of people don't know what K&N stand for. And so that's fascinating yeah. because everybody knows k and is the filter company, but they don't know k and right. Um, you know, you look at other right. brands that the name is the brand, so you know exactly what it is. But I think I've always known, before I even knew their initials, that K&N was a filter company. And that comes with strong branding. And I guess that's through your brand ambassadors and the association of the people who are out there representing you, telling your story. How do you make sure that the story that your racers and properties are telling, how do you make sure it's consistent with the actual message, the brand, and what you're trying to convey. What if someone's telling the wrong message? You know, how do you have sponsor meetings? Do you have a sponsorship workshop or a seminar once a year? Do you get all your racers together? Is there a common, you know, when when you send out logos, there's a logo spec sheet where you have to use the logo in certain positions and colors only using Pantones. But how how do you keep the story consistent? Yeah, it, it you know that's a great question, and I've never really been challenged in that way. Um, I don't know if it's just been, we've been fortunate. Uh, there's been communications, but I think it's any time we come across a partner, we start investing time with them. So it goes back to your previous statement of, hey, how many people have we, we've uh, partnered with before uh, we've had a, com a meeting with them? Uh, there's quite a few. Uh, before, before we start having them work on campaigns though, then we start meeting with them. So it becomes more of the conversation. Do we have uh, local guidelines and brand guidelines and stuff, and we supply all those things. Yes, absolutely. Um, but I think that most of it, we try to leave more organic as we possibly can. We want to hear their story and what's going ah, on. That's good. It's very rare that I've had to have those uh, things. One of our biggest challenges for a number of years was, um, to, to the point of your question, that, that people would always say, uh, we'd have our, our ambassadors say stuff like, you get better gas mileage if you put one of our filters in, right? And theoretically you do, right? But there's no testing. There's way too many variables. You can never prove that. So Canaan can never take the stance in that. And so it was a big struggle for a number of years for us to kind of break that habit of people saying that. Because again, in theory, that's really what it should do, but we couldn't back that up. So then it would take their different things like that we wanted to use or say, and if we wanted to use that person, it was more difficult for us to kind of share the pieces because they would make that kind of claim. And if we used it, it would, it would say that we were supporting it. Um, but for the most part, I, I would say most of it becomes to the ongoing communication. Um, again, understanding our objectives uh, when we do different campaigns, but most of what we leave more organic, we don't get really involved. Um, they're speaking on their own rights and their own uh, purposes. If it's something that we're asking them to do, then we're a little bit more hands-on and, and cool. that way. So your objectives might change. What would cause you to renew with somebody? Do you require proof of performance after events or annual proof of performance reports? What do you do to make sure that the racers and the series and the properties that you sponsor are in line with your future objectives? Yeah, we do. We, 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 keep, a pretty, we keep a pretty close tabs on, on the performance part of it. KPIs are huge, right? But the KPI can be different for the different partnerships, depending on what you're looking for. I holistically look for like a quarterly update based on what's going on. Everybody's programs are a little bit different. And we are, again, ranging anywhere from, you know, somebody that has a two month race season to a 10 month race season, 11 month mm -hmm. race season, or people that have multiple platforms that they're racing on. So it's, it's harder to do, but we look for quarterly updates. Um, we look for inclusion. Um, somebody asked a question earlier about metrics. If they have those, we ask for those on more of a monthly basis. Uh, if it's something they can provide because it goes into some of our reporting. And then we keep a grade sheet. I, I, I go through and I keep everybody on a on grading. And most of that grading is based off of communication, not necessarily on, on, on the performance. Most of it's keeping up with the communication and showing what their efforts are. 
and again, because our, our objectives are to secure content, more organic content and those, those type of things. And that's what we're looking to do. We're looking to exploit our channels a little bit. Do we want our partners to exploit our, our brand through their, their channels? Absolutely. But we're looking for stuff that we can pull from them that helps both of us perform. So we're not looking for it to perform on there. So you don't have to have this you know, million follower network. I work with people currently right now that we actually write a check to that are talking, that barely know how to use the, the internet, right? There's people that we have, Alex, you know a couple of people we've talked about in the past that, that barely know how to use a social media account. But if I ask them to do something and they and their 13 followers doesn't doesn't bother at all. But I can then turn around and use that piece for my own, you know, exploitation. And so again, it's not so much about the performance in those ways, but it's about the effort and the support that goes to this. So we got we got a sliding grade scale. Um, nothing on the official end, but it's something that, that we work on. So I know KN creates a lot of uh non-racer media you you sponsor obviously brand ambassadors and teams but you also have a marketing department that runs advertisements you have tv commercials you have right. you know magazine ads and radio spots i, I think radio spots i'm not sure uh, i don't listen to yep, the radio anymore but how much of that content for your media comes from racers who you sponsor versus how much do you just go out and hire an agency to create or you create in-house do you ever get good stuff from racers and go, oh, wow, we got to make a commercial out of this. This is awesome. Oh, yeah. Look, and, and it's a little bit of both to your point, whether it's agency and, and we have outside agency. We have an internal uh, creative team. Um, but I would say most of the time, even when we're using outside agency, we use our racers within there. Like we have a current campaign that's going on right now. I encourage everybody to look at um, it's called Innovations in Racing, and it's about celebrating the heritage of K&N. And you'll see there's stuff in there from different racers that we sponsor throughout the, throughout the years. And it's footage that we grabbed. Some of the stuff came from that you gave me a couple of years ago from Lucas Oil off road, you know, using Bradley Morris jumping through. We use that in a national campaign. Nice. Um, and we actually reusing some of that stuff today. So, um, Steve Williams in his pro stock car. We actually used uh, Bob Riccati in the NASCAR pro series. Use one of his cars. Um, but these are all fed through our sponsors and our partners. Uh, sponsored partners. It's it's nothing that we go out and just facilitate and fake or, or make up. This is this is all pieces that we either create it using our sponsored guys, or stuff that we've obtained through our partners, like a Lucas Oil off road. Can someone set themselves apart who's looking for sponsorship? Can a a racer who wants a sponsorship from KNN set themselves apart by sending you really cool content and saying, "Hey, look, this is what I will do for you if you sponsor me." Um, or do you rather just see a deck? I, I think it goes together. I think they need to show me what they can do in that deck. I think that's a big part of it, right? And it's not necessarily to the proposal aspect of it. Right. I wouldn't invest anybody to, I wouldn't advise anybody to, to spend their time because if they're truly going to do a real proposal, right? I think they need to get that door open first with a general deck. Yes. If agreed. not, you're going to be spending so much time working on these proposals for somebody that may not fit their agenda, may not even in look, and they're not even looking to open the door as much as you could fit their brand, but it may not be in the car. So even have partnerships that year. And then that's a lot of wasted effort. I think just okay. having that general open door door piece. And I would think that in that deck, you would want to show me some of those examples. It doesn't have to be tailored to K and N show me what you've done for some of your other partners. I think that's just as valuable to me so I can know your potential, Good, right? Whether you have an in-house and you're great at producing your own media and content, or if it's just something that you're partnered with and you say, hey, I've got a, a sponsor over here and it's Total Seal and Total Seal uses me a lot and everything that they do. So I'm able to, to give you that kind of um, um, support through the B2B side. And, and you know, it goes, to, goes through their pieces and I'm able to show that and show me what they do for you. Um, I think those are pieces that I want to see in that deck. Now I'm putting you on the spot because you probably haven't thought about this, but what are some really good examples of things that you've seen in decks or things that have caught your attention that you hadn't seen before? You know, we, we've seen many decks, you see 500 a year and most of them I'm presuming look alike. What made some decks stand out to grab your attention? Um, so some of the guys on the line tonight, some of the ladies on the line who want to get your attention, what can they do or learn from? maybe to put their deck at the top of your, your 
your what your pile yeah your pile yeah i i would say that probably the biggest i would say the biggest eye catching moment is really trying to understand what the business is about and understand uh -huh what it is and the first person that you know that it's usually the the first time i give them attention is when they when they are there to try to show me how they can support my business rather than the other way around so if i can look at somebody's deck and it's really focused about how they can help me exceed rather than i can help them exceed to me they're immediately going to get a, a look over they're immediately going to get some kind of attention Right. That's what I look for. Somebody that's thinking, you know, it's it's coming around to them. That's exactly what we're talking about doing. They want to help me because if I help them, I'll help them. You know, if they help me, I'll help them back. Right. So if they focus on those those agendas, then I, I think it's right. But again, it goes back to understanding a little bit about the business, right? Understanding where, for example, for since we're talking K and M and where we're at, where are we at in the retail chain? Where are we at in the in a distribution chain, understanding a little bit about how our business operates and, and, and where we go. And that's tougher information to get. It takes a little bit of homework to figure out going, hey, do I see them in a four wheel parts? Do I see them in a summit? Where do, where do I see that? Or, or are they a big proponent for direct to consumer sales? You know, are they an Amazon distributor or those kind of things and going, what can I do to support it? You know, I think you and I probably first met at uh, a trade show. I'm going to guess it was either SEMA or PRI. Um, how, how receptive are you to meeting racers looking for sponsorship at trade shows? Or are you busy trying to sell to your distributors and market to distributors products? I think, you know, 15 years ago, 16 years ago, when you and I first met, I didn't know what I was doing back in those days. So I was one of those annoying people coming to you at a trade show. Hey, here's a deck. Here's a deck for, for core back in the days. Um, does that still work? Right. Does that work today? At, at, it was probably several years before you and I developed you know, a relationship that led to a sponsorship. But right. Will you meet people you at know, trade shows or here's, no? Here's, I, I do. I do. But usually it, I will not meet somebody for the first time at a trade show. Okay. There's only so many hours in the day. There's only so much going on. And, and I try my best to stay away from that. And not, not for any reason. He, in, in the bigger reason is because of those two trade shows, which are SEMA and PRI, happen so late in the year. Yeah, I good mean, point. If you go to a trade show and you're just barely getting connected, there's some companies that are okay with that. But as far as I, I've worked over the number of years that I've been there, that's the last place I want to talk about sponsorship. Now, uh, Say this year at SEMA, if I run into somebody and I end up having a great conversation, I'll definitely follow them through 2022 so they have a 2023 consideration. There you go. But if I'm talking to them at SEMA and meeting them for the first time and I don't know who they are, I'm realistically not going to partner with them in 2022 this year. I'm not, I'm not going to make that commitment. I need time to evaluate them. I need time to see what's going on. And I need time to see how they really fit that plan. I'm always up for having those conversations. But, you know, I hate taking those on the fly kind of tasks because, again, I don't want to waste their time. I don't want them to waste my time because if we're just meeting at that point, again, does their opportunity fit my plan? You know, I really don't know. I don't know at that point. So to invest that kind of time in somebody when, you know, we all know how crazy these trade shows are. So for me, when I go to the trade shows, you really won't find me in that booth. Al, I'm at that show. I'm at the show every day. And right. I'm there all day. Um, but I, I'm floating around. I'm going to meeting with people and, and, Trade shows are a great opportunity to connect with a lot of people at one time. That's what they're about, even on the marketing level. You know, trade shows were more about sales for so many years, and now that's changed, and it's more about that marketing and that networking that you can do. Absolutely. Um, but I will tell you, most of the people that I meet with um, at SEMA are things that are planned out, pre-planned, or I've had an ongoing relationship with them of some kind, or somebody that I'm, I'm you know, um, seeking out myself uh, because I have a – a previous uh, encounter with them of some sort um, or recommendation from somebody. I might go to somebody that's like somebody at, you know, the, the, the GM special products category and they say, hey, we're working with so-and-so, we'd like you to be involved. Those are the kind of meetings and the things that I take at those places, um, which is not what, you know, most people want to hear. But again, uh, thinking selfishly, companies like Canaan pay a lot of money to there, to be there and, and to spend that kind of money to trade show to be pitched on the sales. Right. If you want to pitch, I've always had the feeling if you want to pitch somebody on sales, you should have your own booth. <laughs> That's a good point. It's funny. I, 
Earlier today, I had a call with Jamie Meyer. Jamie Meyer now runs PRI. He's the president of PRI, but I, I got to know him back when he was mm -hmm. with per Chevy Chevrolet Performance on the racing side. And today mm -hmm. on the call, he was saying, can I ask him? I said, you know, how, how annoying is it when people come up to you and try to sell you at a trade show? He goes, well, what I used to do is I used to, when two racers would come up to me at the same time and pitch one another, I'd meet Fred and then I'd meet Bob and then I'd introduce Fred to Bob and let them go talk to each other. <laughs> and then Jamie would just disappear. <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I was like, I think he might've yeah, done that. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, yeah. you know, and it, it sucks. It totally sucks. Like, right. Because you're going, this is your opportunity. This is your opportunity to get in front of somebody and make an impression to do one of those yeah. things. But to me, it's not. And, um, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not hurt by it. I'm not offended by it. But I also want people to manage their expectations. If you approach me to the show, I may or may not be able to really consider anything going on at that moment. And, and honestly, it's just going to, it could be a waste of your time and your effort trying to get with me. And you represent 100% of all the marketing directors I know who are at trade shows and who are approached by people handing out decks. You know, when guys, for the attendees on the call, if you're at PRI in Indianapolis, please don't hand out decks to all of the marketing directors. They are not going to bring those decks home. Um, it's added weight in the luggage. And most guys want to get home. They've been right. at an event for a week. So they want to get back home to the family. So they have carry on luggage. They don't check on luggage and your carry on luggage. If, if you have a hundred decks and probably even more than that from a trade show, you're not going to take them home. You're going to unfortunately throw them away. It's a waste. But what you can do is you can get a, a business card, start a relationship, start a conversation, ask later for permission. If they, if you can send them a deck and then send them a deck, if, if they say yes, and they're interested but don't use the time at a trade show to hand out decks. It's, it, it is a waste of time. You're, you're kind of a, you're, you're being more of an annoyance than a help and use the trade show as a time to get to meet people. We're going to, I just noticed that we're almost on the hour here and I try to only do hour long webinars. Tammy, are there some questions that we really need to address before I ask Tony the magic question, any final words, my friend, but let's see if Tammy has something first. about the trade shows being right at the end of the year but what is your deadline for uh good sponsorships? Call. that's good and what's your fiscal year also fiscal year and when you make your decisions our, our fiscal year really follows our calendar year so it, it's just the january december like a lot of people do it and again because of the way the racing uh series the the overall series usually run um uh but we you know i'm looking for decks all the time send me a deck any day of the week. You send it to me January 1st. Maybe that I, I, I and even if there's an opportunity to partner with somebody, there's there's always help that can be made there. There's always something if, if there's a right partnership and we can work towards something that's a little bit more official. Um, I do a lot of those and I'll, I'll take them anytime. I won't really even look at a proposal until the fourth quarter, which gives us a tight window, right? It really does have a tight window, but here's the thing. It's like, I can look at proposals all day long, but if, again, I don't know my plan. Right. I'm still trying to wrap up my plan for the current year and try to figure out how it's going to change for the following year. And when that happens around the fourth quarter, so I start taking proposals at that time to kind of feed, kind of feed into Nice, that. nice. Um, so it's I don't think there's ever a late or too early or too late when it comes to time on on decks, but proposals definitely keep them within that that last quarter. Excellent. And top of top of mind and. And here's the thing, your, your, your program should always be evolving, right? And going with the flow of what's going on. So you definitely don't want to give out a proposal too soon either um, because you may not be able to offer those same kind of things and you may disappoint somebody, but at the same time, you might have something additional that you can offer that you didn't have in, in June, right? Because your programs evolved. You might have more to offer in, in that, in that uh, September time than you do in that, in that June. Right on. I like that. And I totally agree. And I like that you also differentiate between decks and proposals. The deck is just to start the relationship. The proposal is to propose an official business relationship with a brand who you already know. So they are two separate documents. Um, Tony, I'm going to wrap it up now, but can you stay on for a couple of minutes with some of our guests and perhaps uh, sure. I'll let them just ask you direct one-on-one -on -one questions. Yeah, I'd love to. Yep. All right. Well, thank you everybody for attending. We are at the one hour mark. It went pretty fast again this time. Holy crap. Only one, only one technical issue with lights going out. That wasn't so bad. <laughs> that wasn't bad. Yeah. Yeah. Usually, usually all hell's breaking loose. <laughs> this, this one actually went really well. So Tony, your words of wisdom are amazing. Thank you so much for joining. This was awesome. Um, everybody Thanks stay tuned. Having. I'm going to go switch screens.